Welcome everyone to this uh, this session of, of the realizing the European Open Science Cloud event. Um, this session is is really um, specific to the to the Freya project and its its work. Uh, it's an introduction to sustainability of the persistent identifier infrastructure um, and the so-called um, PID Commons. So that's one of the, uh, the pillars of the Freya project. Um, and we're also, in particular, we're going to be hearing about some uh, work that's been done, um, a study on, on the uh, scoping of the idea of a, a, a PID federation or alliance uh, and the implications of that. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my, my slides now, just one, one moment. Um, <clears throat> right. Okay, now hopefully you can you can see the introductory title slide. So yeah, that's the that's the session. Um, um, so today's program, um, um, I'm going to be giving a, a, an introduction to the sustainability of the persistent identifier infrastructure and the ideas of the PID Commons that Freya has been developing. Um, then the centerpiece uh, of this session will be um, an account of the report on the work on the possibility of a PID federation. Uh, uh, Rachel Katarski of the British Library will be giving that. Uh, uh, Torsten Reimer uh, is, is not, uh, not available today. Uh, and then we'll conclude with a, a panel discussion with a range of stakeholders in the persistent identifier world talking about some of the issues that, that arise from these things. Uh, okay, so um, I'm just going to start with my own, my own presentation now. Um, so um, you don't have to know much about the Freya project to, to know that we, we always say that we have three pillars of Freya. Um, and that's been the case ever, ever since the, the beginning, the, the PID graph, the PID forum and the PID commons. Um, the, the PID graph and the, and the PID forum are, are relatively uh, concrete things. Uh, the PID forum in particular um, has actually materialized as a, as a um, a discussion forum website at pidforum.org, uh, which is um, a very active site uh, for uh, the community to, to come together, um, raise and discuss issues around persistent identifiers. Um, and uh, of course, this was set up uh, within one of the within, within the Freya project. Um, but I'm, I'm pleased to say that um, we've actually uh, assured its sustainability beyond the project now. Uh, there was a session yesterday afternoon uh, on the and it looks like simon's frozen again hopefully we'll get him back in a second yeah yeah uh -oh. you're back again simon i think oh right. if you want uh, to turn off your video while we're looking yeah. at your slides let maybe me, that'll help sure. yeah let me do that um uh Okay, let's see if that makes a makes a difference. Um, okay, so yes, I was just saying about the about the PID forum. Uh, the the PID graph, of, of course, is the is the, the technical center of, of of Freya. I mean, it's it's what the, the it's the it's the infrastructure part. It's it's what the development of, of the PID graph is. What the the project is all about, um, and that's a fairly concrete thing as well. It exists at, at several levels. Um, there's a there's a vision, the motivating vision of the PID graph as a, a a rich network of things with persistent identifiers on top of which um, applications can be built. And then there's the the general technical basis for the PID graph. And we had a session by um, Martin Fenner uh, on that earlier uh, in this conference. Uh, and then there's the applications of the PID graph, and we also had a session on those yesterday. Um, so that's a very concrete thing. The PID Commons is is um, somewhat uh, more nebulous. It's not it's not a thing in the same way. It's it's what it does rather than than what it is. Um, so the the description that we have is that refers to the concern of the PID Commons, and that concern is sustainability, uh, the sustainability of the PID infrastructure resulting from Freya beyond the lifetime of the project itself. Uh, defining roles, responsibilities, and structures for good self-governance based on consensual decision-making. Um, so there are some boundary conditions here. Um, so the the PID Commons is is not going to be a single body or organisation. Um, 
but it, it does need to have some kind of existence or identity. It can't just be completely nebulous um, or it wouldn't really have any, any, any impact or, or, or meaning um, really or, or significance. Um, it should interact with or even include um, appropriate existing bodies uh, uh, in the world of persistent identifiers, for example, um, RDA, um, the EOSC itself, of course, uh, and, and others. Um, it needs to have the desirable attributes that we always talk about in, to, in the context of sustainability, uh, openness, representativeness, trustworthiness, etc. And the commons itself should be should be sustainable. Uh, I mean, it's concerned with sustainability of the infrastructure, but as as a or, or a collection of structures and processes, it needs to be sustainable in itself. Uh, so what what we did as an early stage in, in Freya is to is to think about what we really mean by sustainability. It's it's quite easy when thinking of sustainability to uh, jump into talking about um, funding, uh, to talking about governance mechanisms, which are, are all important aspects of, of sustainability. Um, but be before getting to that level, it's it's necessary to think what we really mean by sustainability. Um, so these are three facets of sustainability that we, we put forward in Freya. These are very general things. Um, and this is this is what we we understand sustainability means. It's really breaking down the term uh, into into these three facets. Uh, the first one is maintainability. So it's it's the capacity of the infrastructure to continue operating as is. Um, so that can be at a, a technical level, you know, making sure that the the services continue to run, that they 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 meet their their service standards, uh, that they have required capacity. Um, but it also includes includes funding because the you know the, the funding is is what ensures the capacity of the infrastructure uh, to continue operating. Uh, the second facet is is adaptability. So it's the capacity of the infrastructure to respond to new opportunities, requirements and challenges, um, which can arise in various ways, um, technological developments, um, changes in, in user expectations or behaviour, for example. Um, you can't really say that an infrastructure is sustainable unless it can adapt to that kind of change. Uh, and the third facet is, is desirability. Uh, so it's the capacity of the infrastructure to attract and retain users, and that includes users in a broad sense, so that would include service providers. Um, what is it about the, the infrastructure that will make people stay with it rather than using something else and that will attract uh, providers of services to the infrastructure into it? Um, so these are the three facets in terms of which we, we, we think of sustainability and, and analyze it. Um, of course, Freya is hardly alone in um, uh, working on, on sustainability of the infrastructure. Freya is one of the projects that's contributing to the building of the European Open Science Cloud. Uh, and at the highest level, the European Open Science Cloud has been doing and continues to do uh, work of its own on sustainability. So the, the latest iteration of this is the so-called Iron Lady document, um, which is, has just been released. Um, uh very very recently um what are the concerns of of uh, the iron lady and therefore of eosk sustainability uh well at one level they seem to be rather different from the kind of thing that we're thinking about in in freya um they talk about the uh the minimum viable eosk uh um the eosk as, as a federation uh of of resources uh and 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 providers um they address the issues of uh, future expansion and the whole complex of, of funding uh, that is, is needed for that. Uh, the question of the network effect uh, and what incentives are required at an early stage to encourage um, providers and users to, to engage with the EOS and thereby uh, attain the critical mass that is needed. Uh, they're concerned with high level governance, for example, the EOSC Association, um, and the and the legal entity that has recently been formed, uh, and they're concerned with with risk management. Um, 
Now, as I say, those those seem to be rather different level of concerns from the kind of thing we're thinking about with the sustainability of the PID infrastructure. But you can um, think of these things in terms of the three facets. I mean, the network effect and uh, incentives is is to do with with desirability. Uh, what what is it um, about the EOSC that will attract people to come in and, and generate the network effect? Um, uh, the, uh, uh, the risk management is, is concerned with uh, maintainability um, and so on. You can, you can interpret these uh, in terms of those, those three facets. Uh, so one of, the, one of the issues for EOSC and, and, and for Freya in its, its closing stages is, is bringing these together and, and relating them together uh, in, a, in a coherent way. Um, I'm now going to change uh, change my tax slightly and um, move on to this uh, idea of a, a PID federation um, as an aspect of, of sustainability. Uh, so this um, took shape as a workshop uh, that was held in the, the Pidapalooza conference in, in January uh, this year. Uh, in fact, funnily enough, that was the very last uh, international conference I attended in person, although I didn't know that at the time, of course. Um, Lisbon, it was held, uh, and there was a workshop um, uh, uh, with, I don't know, it was around about 30 or 40 uh, attendees, um, considering the idea of a PID federation. And the, the conclusion that came out was that um, we agreed that it would be useful for further investigation to be undertaken to fully understand the landscape for PID stakeholders and their needs for representation and, and governance. Um, so the, the issues were, uh, uh, there, was, there was a feeling that um, the way things work at the moment, although it's, you know, it's clearly sustainable in some way and is being sustained, that there's, it, one could go a bit further in terms of representation of stakeholders and some kind of coherence uh, in, in the way um, that, that stakeholder views are, are represented and, and, and governed. Um, so the, the concrete follow-up for that was uh, an invitation to tender uh, and the selection of a consultant, namely Josh Brown, uh, to conduct the study on behalf of Freya. Uh, so Josh's report uh, has been published. Um, there was also a webinar held uh, presenting the results, uh, which uh, you can also see if you wish to have, if you wish to do so. Um, now, this is going to be the subject of Rachel's talk, so I, I'm not going to say any more about this. Um, although I should emphasize that the report is, is not itself the, the Freya position on the PID Federation. Um, we are formulating a, a, a kind of perspective or position on the Federation, which is um, amplifying certain points or qualifying others or making uh, specific recommendations. Um, the report itself is in a way the, the raw material, although it does contain recommendations of its own. Um, it's, it's not the Freya position, it's certainly not by any means the, the EOSC position. Um, so how, do, how does this idea of a PID federation relate to sustainability and the, and the PID commons? Um, well, it's, I mean, it's really simple in a way in that there's a, a, um, an overlap, but neither of them is a subset of the other. The PID federation is concerned with more than sustainability. Um, we're going to hear about that, I'm sure, but particularly, for example, the emphasis on uh, inclusion, inclusiveness, although you could certainly argue that that's an aspect of desirability, um, that what, of, of attracting a, a wider range of stakeholders who might be underrepresented at the moment. Um, sustainability is broader than the PID Federation. There are aspects of sustainability, um, particularly the, you know, the ongoing operations and um, uh, assuring um, the standards of, of service and so on, which are certainly not going to be the concern of, of, of any PID Federation. Uh, but there will be areas of overlap. Um, so we can certainly say that um, anything that emerges from this work uh, will certainly have a central role to play in the PID Commons. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean that's that I think is is um, the end of what I what I have to say uh, about uh, Freya's work on sustainability uh, and introducing the the PID Federation. This is just a, a reminder of of what's coming up. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Um, and um, so uh, I wonder if there are any any 
questions on that um, before I hand over to Rachel for her part of the talk. You can either type in the chat or, or I guess just, just speak. No, if there's nothing at the moment, then um, I'm sure we'll have some good good discussions during the panel session. So, Rachel, I think I'll just hand over to you in that case uh, for the PID Federation. Lovely. Thank you. So let me get my slides up. And the good thing about doing this virtually is that I could delete the one slide that overlapped with Simon um, while he was presenting it. So you won't get the same information twice, hopefully. So I'm Rachel Katarski. I'm head of research infrastructure services at the British Library. Just to take you through a few of the highlights uh, from the report that Josh uh, gave to the Freya project, the result of the work he did for us uh, over the summer this year. So my slides are heavily cribbed from the presentation um, that he gave at the webinar a few weeks ago that Simon linked to, and you'll see another link to that again later here as well. Um, so uh, Simon mentioned Pidapalooza after we'd had a few discussions within the project actually at the end of 2018 uh, in December at the British Library about whether something um, like an organisation could support sustainability uh, of the work going forward, we wanted to take some of those ideas to a small group of critical friends. And so it happened that Pidapalooza was only about six weeks after we'd met and had that discussion at the British Library. So we very hastily put together a bit of a small breakfast meeting at Pidapalooza to discuss some of those ideas with some friendly faces. Uh, it was a breakfast meeting and yet I think we filled up the room, uh, which is quite impressive. You can see how dark it is outside of uh, the windows in that conference room. And taking some of those ideas to our group of critical friends, uh, it was still clear that it was difficult to find a kind of coherent set of activities that any organisation moving forward could support uh, in terms of sustainability. We had a few ideas um, with the British Libraries uh, having a, a statutory role in the UK around preservation, the sort of preservation around metadata and sustainability of metadata uh, was one idea that came up. There were also ideas continuing uh, on the comms and advocacy around persistent identifiers. But again, all these ideas that we were having was very difficult to boil down into a coherent set of activities that any one organisation um, or aggregation of organisations could actually perform. So what we decided to do is take that forward in the uh, commissioned research that Josh ended up uh, winning. Um, it was relatively short amount of time that we had left within the project. We did it over this summer with the Freya project uh, ending at the end of this month. We didn't have much time or much resources to actually really do a really broad open consultation globally which is what you know was the ideal but also the fact that with a lack of coherence and focus and some of the ideas that we had it was difficult to take that out to a very broad open group uh, for discussion because actually we'd have got equally incoherent uh, and difficult to navigate responses back so that's why we decided on a short focused uh, closed consultation for this piece of research. What we did want to do is make sure we got more voices than just the voices we could get in the room uh, in Port, uh, Dublin, sorry that was Dublin not Portugal, I'm confusing myself, uh, for Pidapalooza uh, at a breakfast meeting. We really wanted to open up to more diverse opinion, um, get buy-in from a broader range of stakeholders at the beginning. We wanted to be uh, inclusive, but also, as Josh puts here, it, it was impossible for us to really go wide, really boil the ocean. Um, we needed to have a, a focused set of discussions to kick this work off, so that's what we did. The research itself was carried out uh, in three stages. So there were interviews, uh, Josh put together a, a good list of uh, individuals who we had a good idea would be interested in this idea of a PID Federation um, to do semi-structured interviews to pull out some of the threads of ideas we discussed within the project as well as opening it up to other thoughts and ideas. Um, we expanded that initial group with a set of questionnaires 
Um, because of the limited time, um, we couldn't do semi-structured interviews with a larger group of people. But in order to uh, expand and balance geography, discipline, um, stakeholder group within the kid community, um, we set out a set of questionnaires. The interviews and the questionnaires were used to pull together a kind of interim report, some early findings, some statements reflecting uh, on the questions set by the Freya project to the research. And that uh, initial report was then given to people who were invited to focus groups for the last stage. So those focus groups allowed us to do a bit of a deep dive into um, some of the themes that had come out of the interviews and the questionnaires to really discuss the, the context of that work and um, enable that cross stakeholder discussion about what the implications were, were coming out of some of those initial findings. Um, again, trying to open up inclusion, we held um, those focus groups in three different time zones. Uh, so we covered the Americas, uh, Europe, Middle East and Africa and Asia Pacific. Again, it was difficult to get people along to those aside uh, their other day jobs, but we had some great discussions uh, around the interim results. So from those three pieces of work, these are the headline findings that Josh presented us with. Uh, it was heartening to see that generally there was a feeling that some kind of organization, a PID federation could bring more coherence and coordination uh, across the PID community going forward. But there were also some findings that um, I wouldn't necessarily uh, say conflict each other, but they cause a bit of tension in terms of what we might try to do moving forward. So one of those is a clear steer that creating a completely separate and new uh, legal entity or organisation, if you like, uh, would create overheads uh, that might mean there are costs involved that make it difficult to enable uh, inclusion. Um, but that slightly pushes against the final bullet point on this slide, which is about having something that can move forward with the resources to actually take concrete actions and actually give, deliver solutions. So finding a way uh, to have some kind of an organisation that doesn't create extra overhead and yet is resourced to uh, achieve things um, is going to be something that it's going to be a fine line to actually walk uh, in terms of moving this work forward. Uh, the other two bullet points here talk about communication and inclusivity, uh, and those are definitely uh, some of the key themes that are coming out, which I'll come to again at the end. So these are the headline findings, but Josh actually pulled together 10, a set of 10 recommendations directly to the Freya project for us to look at how we take forward. So it was good to hear, as uh, we mentioned in the highlights, that the PID Federation or something akin to that would be generally welcome. Um, but I think recommendation two here really reflects on the good work that Freya itself has done over the last uh, three years. So in terms of needing something that helps to drive adoption of persistent identifiers, support sustainability, but actually the key to that is articulating the benefits of the uh, identifier ecosystem as a whole when we uh, interoperate with each other, when we join up, when we get use of a broad set of identifiers and connect them together, um, that they become more than the sum of their parts. And I think that's something that Freya itself has definitely driven over the last three years, and it's good to see that there is an appetite to continue the good work uh, beyond the project. Uh, knowledge sharing is also something that Freya has done, uh, as Simon mentioned, around the, the PID forum, um, all the work we've done with ambassadors throughout the project. And I think, again, recommendation four here really reflects on the good work that the Freya project has done. And it's heartening to see that this is something that the community itself would like to continue to see someone uh, doing and that there is an important role there. Um, uh, recommendations five, six, and in fact seven all speak to inclusivity and how we broaden uh, participation in any uh, PID federation going forward. I think the communication aspect um, also comes out here. You know, I mentioned about Pidapalooza, I think there's a tendency. Uh, for us to go, we're doing a good job with comms, we're reaching out to people, we're doing a lot of work in the community. 
But in reality, I think we get the same kind of nodding heads in the room on quite a regular basis. And it will be important for us going forward to reach out to communities who we don't usually speak to beyond our comfort zones. And I kind of mean that geographically in terms of uh, Europe, North America, Australia, reaching out to the research communities beyond those comfort zones. Um, it also came out that decentralization is key here. If you have a, a single body uh, with an office in a single place, it actually becomes more difficult to reach out to those global communities and reach beyond those uh, traditional boundaries that we might see. Oops, I've gone too far. Um, number seven speaks to one of those tensions about resourcing an organization to do that work uh, in terms of outreach, advocacy, interoperability uh, on limited funds. Uh, one of the key um, statements that I remember from the focus group is about participation needing to be cheaper than free. So, you know, organizations uh, outside of North America, uh, North, Northern Europe, it's not necessarily about not having money for membership fees, but they don't necessarily have the people resources to participate in all the activities that we might want to push forward uh, within the PID community. And actually, we might need to underwrite participation in some cases, not just, you know, make something free to attend, but actually, how do they get there to attend things, uh, assuming we're even able to meet uh, physically at any point in the next few years. Um, and so, again, that that point on cost also speaks to inclusivity. Um, the last two points that we have um, point to actually understanding what activities should come out of all of these recommendations and really testing them uh, with the people who we hope they will impact. Um, what we need to do is pick activities that we think will have good impact, good value for money, as in, you know, what can we do uh, for cheap, if not for free, that actually deliver uh, change for the PID community and that enable uh, inclusivity and communications. And I think that picking these priority activities are really more important for deciding what the shape of any future organization or association or whatever you want to call it will be in the future. Actually, we need to understand what it is needs to be done first before we say what uh, legal structure that needs to be done within. Um, and so to understand what those concrete actions are, we know that we need to do a fuller, more global, open consultation. But at least now we have what we were missing before we could do that, and that is a bit of focus. And so out of these recommendations, I've talked about these uh, priorities and themes already and going through them, are inclusion, communication and interoperability. So with these three priorities as a bit of focus for those actions, we can now, we have something we can take forward to full open, uh, hopefully global consultation to get an idea of what those priority actual actions activities should be. Um, so again, it's it's about what actions can we do that drive inclusivity, that support comms and interoperability. Um, these are the points that Josh has tasked the, the Freya project with looking to the future with. Um, Although I mentioned that the Freya project itself is uh, finishing at the end of this month, across the project partners are committed to continue to looking at how we can push this work forward, how we can uh, build on the priorities of uh, inclusivity comms and interoperability. Um, and um, uh, what we need to do is look at who else we need to work with to make that uh, truly globally inclusive and I think that in terms of that broader uh, open consultation one of the things that worries me is about carrying on that global open consultation and doing it let's say completely in English uh, where we leave out communities um, who don't have English as a first language and might feel much easier and more comfortable talking about what their needs are in uh, their own uh, mother tongues and languages so I think we're really going to have to think about how we consult across the board with research communities where English may not be there, uh, might not be a language that they're able to 
discuss these quite uh, kind of technical and complex administrative requirements that they have uh, with us. And I think we should strongly think about how we uh, enable dis uh, discussion and discourse with those communities, not in English, essentially. And again, all of this, um, why is that in there again? I don't know. Um, so one of the things uh, that has been discussed, and Simon mentioned it earlier, is what we call this thing. And again, I don't, we, we should be a bit cautious about there being a thing to actually have a name while we don't know what those activities are. One of the pieces of feedback we did get from Josh's work was that the, the name PID Federation was not ideal. It sounded a bit old and stuffy. Um, so within the project, we've talked about uh, a PID Alliance instead. Um, I think either of these work, um, with my uh, slightly sci-fi hat on, I can see good representations for federations and alliances, um, but also I would recommend people to go and have a look at Jonathan Clark's slides uh, from the PID interest group at RDA uh, the other week, uh, talking about his thoughts on the PID federation uh, and also the fact that um, that gives us a steer to have a prime directive as well. So definitely check out his slides, which I've linked to there. Um, and that's it from me in terms of a summary of Josh's work. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Rachel. Um, that was very, very clear summary. Um, some very good points there. I mean, especially about the the, the language issue. I mean, it's it's yeah, so uh, easy for us in in. EOS context uh, to think that well you know English is is all you need um, and clearly that's that's not always the case. Um, I noticed that a few few questions have, have come up. Um, one of them um, about uh, about the implications of Brexit for all this. Um, this is in the chat window. What will the British Library role be after Brexit? How much will BL be involved in Freya? And PIDs. Um, well, as, as as has been said, the Freya project itself is is coming to an end soon. Um, but uh, Rachel, could you? Yeah, I mean, is there? A, yeah. Absolutely. I think the Freya project itself, as you mentioned, is ending. Obviously, there is a lot of work going on within EOSC itself um, around uh, persistent identifiers and making sure that uh, infrastructures that plug into EOSC involve persistent identifiers. I think where um, UK based infrastructure plugs into that will definitely continue to be an advocate for persistent identifiers and the requirements around them uh, supporting those research infrastructures in the UK to plug in where they are able to. But persistent identifiers go beyond uh, EOSC and European research. They really do support global linking. There is a global PID graph, not just a European PID graph uh, of research. So I think we'd absolutely continue to want to play a role in that. Um, you know, we've already done that since um, becoming a member of data site right at the beginning. We've always wanted to support our other data sites, uh, members and colleagues internationally. Um, so I definitely think that we will have a role that will not be determined um, by Brexit and however that works out uh, over the next few months. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, I can see we also have a, uh, a comment about um, uh, a key partner to work with in, in Africa. Uh, so yeah, we'll we'll take that on board. Um, are there any uh, questions about Rachel's talk uh, um, before we, we move on to the, the, the panel discussion? So yeah, so either type them in the chat or simply unmute yourself and, and speak. <laughs> Hi there, uh, it's Nicholas here. Uh, just to say, <clears throat> I posted that comment uh, about um, Africa Archive because um, that would be just a good example, I think, of um, a partner who uh, doesn't necessarily have uh, funds um, or, or a, a lot of funding as yet. Um, uh, and who knows if that situation can change drastically at any point, but um, is attempting to sort of um, make freely available to researchers from Africa and, and writing about Africa or publishing about Africa, uh, a set of co sort of commonly available resources, but um, is in a position of maybe uh, not, not having the kinds of infrastructure that could, that something like Freya could make um, more freely and widely available um, with the kinds of uh, skills that are um, 
you know more 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 widely accessible in in the European and and American context. So I just wanted to mention that that's 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 the context in which I say I, I typed that. So it's it's it is in response to Rachel's um, presentation. Absolutely, and I think that we continue to want to do a lot more in terms of that knowledge and skill sharing. Um, we have to feed into any wider consultation. What are the methods we could use to increase participation that are not just about um, skills and knowledge sharing, but actually are about access to resources as well, whether that's financial or people resources. Um, but I also think that this consultation needs to be done uh, collaboratively um, with organizations outside of what I called our comfort zones of uh, North America, Europe, Australia, um, because I'm very keen, especially with everything else that's gone on within 2020, that you know, the, the European and North American organizations that are the Freya partners at the moment, don't have that kind of we will come and save you with our PIDs uh, kind of attitude to, to communities outside our comfort zone, that actually we work with people um, rather than kind of coming in and saying, well, this is how we think you should do things and this is how we'll save you. Um, I think it needs to be done a lot more collaboratively uh, and considerately than that. Thank yes, you so thank much, Rachel. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks for the resp response. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, okay, so we have a, a question here about uh, integration of PIDs of the same digital object, for example, persons having uh, more uh, more persistent identifiers. I mean, that that is a, a, a very good question, but um, I suspect it's not quite for this session um, uh, on sustainability. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a PID graph question, definitely. Um, I think it maybe it's, just it, speaks to the interoperability question. It, uh, true, that's that, true, yes. yes. Uh, making it, sure yeah. that as new PIDs arrive, uh, emerge from different communities, that there is room mm. for them within the PID graph, that there is interoperability between systems, and that mm. PID systems as, themselves are aware of all the other PIDs that are out there. Um, so definitely we see that a bit with uh, people identifiers, with things like international standard name identifiers, ISME, that links across ORCID and VIAF, and also ORCID links across those uh, as well, where it has information. Um, so yeah, I think that definitely speaks to interoperability about being aware that what exists now is not going to be it forever, and that new things will emerge. Yeah. Enabling those crosswalks is key. Um, the same with the national person identifying an ORCID ID, enabling that crosswalk is key to, to building that interoperability. I think we are actually starting to slide into the, the panel session now. So I think I will probably formally introduce it because uh, the panelists are speaking and, and actually addressing some of the, the issues. So um, we have we have four, four panelists. Um, um, there's uh, Matt Bays from Data Site, uh, Rachel again uh, from British Library, um, uh, Katrina McCallum from uh, Hindawi, the publisher, and uh, Juan Bikaregi from my own organization, STFC. Juan is, is very keyed into the, the high levels of uh, EOSC uh, governance. Um, so uh, four panelists, and um, we've, I've, we've selected a, a few questions to try and stimulate the discussion. I mean, what, I, what I'm going to do, I think, is just, to just pose a question and see if one of the panelists would like to, to open, open the, the discussion. Um, I think that um, uh, hopefully this will will uh, stimulate some some thoughts and questions from other participants. And in that case, I suggest you 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 use the chat window uh, to uh, for your questions, so we don't have too many people trying to to speak at once. Um, so um, these are some questions which which came up from thinking around the the ideas of the the PID Federation. Um, certainly a communication and, and advocacy was one of the uh, focuses for the PID Federation that was very much emphasized. So given that that's desirable, um, 
uh, from your various perspectives as, as panelists, who do, who do you think would be the audience for the communication and, and what would be the message? Or one could ask the same question about about advocacy. Um, who who would who would the, the PID Federation Alliance be advocating to, and and what would they what would they or we be advocating? I mean, I'd be okay to to start. Um, mm -hmm. So I uh, I think um, the short answer is almost everybody, um, because um, we need. Uh, at the moment, and, and I think it's 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 very apparent from this meeting, the Freya discussion, that there's um, a real sense of urgency about um, PIDs and the metadata for those who are working with them and understand them, as Rachel pointed out. The research community are completely unaware, almost completely unaware, of the value and importance, uh, and there's there's there is a debate to be had about whether they should know about it. Um, but I think to the point that it it affects the way they curate their data, make decisions about how to make that public, how to make their data, uh, how to make their research discoverable. That there needs to be some level of awareness. Um, likewise, I think that although um, there are some publishers who appreciate um, uh, the necessity of PIDs and, and you know, it's really obvious for publishers of you know, things like DOIs. There are many, many publishers and publishing service providers that don't use DOIs and don't have that connection or understanding. And so there's a, there's a real need, a uh, sort of bottom up need for education and awareness about the value of these. And sometimes it's it's about pointing out the self-interest of having these, which is cheaper, more cost-effective workflows and making sure that outputs are discovered um, more easily. Um, in relation to publishers as well, I think the uh, advocacy needs to be also around the extent to which the metadata um, that comes with PIDs is, is open. And this reflects um, sort of a historical legacy where metadata hasn't traditionally been open. Uh, and, um, and there is, so there is now tension between what metadata ought to be open or not open. And, and so from a publisher perspective, I can speak to this is that uh, DOIs, yep, they're all publicly available. Um, citation information about citation information or metadata about abstracts um, is done on a sort of um, voluntary basis by um, publishers via Crossref. Um, and that means that um, the potential of uh, this whole initiative cannot be realized unless those scholarly outputs are seen as, um, uh, uh, or, or are required to be uh, made publicly open and then services built and paid for on top of that. Um, and I think there's also um, advocate, I mean, at the moment cross-ref for publishers, and I'm speaking from a publisher point of view, is, is a completely essential part of the infrastructure as data site and, um, other um, organizations, infrastructure organizations are, are also becoming essential, but there is a huge amount of exclusion of uh, the community of service providers, um, publishing services that are outside of those communities. And it's how we can connect those um, both in terms of, of um, raising awareness and education, but also the language um, and the equity issues um, to enable this. I'll, I'll stop there because otherwise I'll speak too much. I think, um, oh, sorry, Ryan, do you want to go ahead? Oh, oh. Sorry, you put up your hand. Uh, oh, I'll jump in and just follow on. Um, I, I, I thought, yeah, I, I mean, your your points are really um, good, Katrina. Um, the, the, 
the focus on metadata is so important for everything that we're talking about. And we, I think sometimes lose sight of the fact that we talk about PID so much and we focus so much on this actual PID and forget about the metadata. And in making that metadata useful and valuable to the community, I would say some advocacy really needs to be focused around the, the systems and the providers of those systems. And I'm not saying exclusively the commercial systems because I think this is the key inclusivity piece. And, you know, um, Nicholas raised a really good point, you know, about Africa Archive, that how do we enable these services and make sure that these systems can easily overcome these technical barriers, these resource barriers, these financial barriers that broader communities have to enable them to um, adopt services, um, have rich metadata, enable the interoperability across identify infrastructure um, so that everyone can benefit. And that speaks to some of the other points around, well, what about these different PIDs and how do we enable that? And I think the key is getting those systems to enable that um, because without those, we not we we constantly are going to come into the uh, come up with these barriers um, for including broader communities. Yeah, uh, thanks. I hundred percent agree about the importance of the metadata and standards on that, so that we can do the cross you know cross graph jumping that we've talked about a lot. So that's absolutely critical at the technical level. I wanted to go back to the point about the audience and the point. Uh, Catriona made about researchers don't generally know what's going on with the PIDs and do they need to. Um, so let me try out a, an argument. I'm not sure I believe this, but let's try it out and see what the reaction is. I would argue that um, researchers don't need to know about PIDs, that we shouldn't target researchers, that PIDs should be part of an invisible infrastructure that uh, researchers really just need to use without actually sort of looking under the hood. Um, let's take an example. Um, if a researcher is thinking about a paper, do, do they think about the DOI or do they think about the author and title, right? So clearly they think about the author and the title, not the DOI, and that's how it should be. So the same should probably be true in other areas where we use PIDs. They should be thinking about whatever's convenient for them. The PIDs should be something invisible that um, is just happening um, but, for example, with papers, we often see the DOI in the reference and, and we have to ask ourselves, why is that there? Is that a hangover from when we had things on paper? Because on a screen, the DOI is just something you click on and it could be hidden. You could just be clicking on the title of the paper or the title of the author or whatever it is that's actually the more useful thing. Um, for the authors to think, for the researchers to think about. So that's my first point. Um, PIDs should be part of an invisible infrastructure that researchers shouldn't need to talk about. Then, of course, we talk about how we can enable that and the data infrastructure providers or the publishers or whoever it is that is making that mapping from you know uh, you, things that researchers like to think about to some hidden number deep in the bowels of the data infrastructure that never sees the light of day. Um, what do we have to think about for them? Um, well, there the message for, that we need to be pushing, I think is um, about increasing the adoption of PIDs for different types of things. Um, we've made a lot of progress in recent years in moving you know, to data and, and instruments and organizations, as well as people. Um, but I think that's just the start. I think we should really be trying to think very, very broadly that everything should have PIDs underneath. Things that are not even persistent themselves should have persistent identifiers. Uh, an example here, in the good old days when I used to fly places, I would go with a flight number and a date and those, the combination of those two identified the flight. So in a way, the combinations of PID, but I bet somewhere inside the airline booking system, there was a PID that was specific to a particular flight rather than a particular flight on a particular day. Um, in shopping orders, you know, I'd go into my orders on my supermarket shopping list 
and the combination of the supermarket name and the order number probably gives me a PID, but that's a transient thing. When we're talking about data, you know, a particular collision at the LHC, it's a very, very transient thing indeed, but the identifier for it is persistent. So, and needs to be persistent because you want to be able to refer back to something. Um, so I think the message should be around increasing the different types of PIDs that we are, we should be very ambitious in increasing the range of things that we want to give PIDs to. But, but let's get there one step at a time. Uh, I see, Juan, you're getting some some pushback in the in the chat about the invisible infrastructure. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I was also wondering, may I respond to that? Of course. Um, um, uh, I'm, I'm sort of half keeping my hand attached, so I think I, I, I think this this uh, resonates with what some people are saying as well. But um, I think PIDs shouldn't be I I invisible um, to the. Ex I think PIDs should be invisible to the workflows that researchers are using so that things are seamless so they don't have to see the pipe work when they're trying to discover stuff. But I think they absolutely need to be aware and there needs to be a raised awareness of the importance of infrastructure and the services um, around that infrastructure that makes their research discoverable and accessible. I think this affects uh, could, uh, could potentially affect the choice of uh, where, for example, researchers choose to put their work either with a publisher or on a, or on a platform. Those that choose to put their work where there are good uh, bids, lots of good and open metadata are going to be at a major advantage. Uh, again, this is likely to impact those more in the uh, Europe and, and the US and the global north and to not make that awareness more widely known could further disadvantage others. Um, and the um, other point, so and I think at the moment researchers are choosing based on, for example, I mean just to go back to that old debate about they choose where to publish, they choose where to publish now there are some disciplines where there are in the humanities really good were highly ranked journals that have no DOIs. They are, in fact, they're not even online. And yet researchers think that's the place to publish. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we have to raise awareness and also awareness that uh, putting in uh, and, and making those services high quality and open actually costs money and needs to be supported because at the moment, a lot of researchers think peer review is what costs, but with increasing digital uh, you know and the network that infrastructure itself is a incredibly valuable service that is being left out um, but also itself i think the pids and the metadata around uh, and i am speaking about the the research scholarly knowledge essentially um, is itself becoming a research subject area um, and this uh, itself the, the the sort of notion of research and research which has been within the social sciences for a long time is becoming much uh, uh, more seen as, as a much greater and, and urgent requirement among the physical and biomedical sciences where using that data, exposing that data um, uh, means that you can provide new insights on what works and what doesn't in terms of access, discovery, collaboration uh, um, and the whole notion of uh, um, uh, you know what what the what the scholarly communications field is um, and so I think there's two reasons one is researchers need to be advocates and they need to be aware and to um, there needs to be awareness that this is a, a ripe area for research itself we should be a, a, its own discipline I think I I had a response to this um thinking about as Todd puts it the uh, invisible infrastructure if it's invisible people kind of devalue it but certainly one of the things that comes around when people talk about not valuing invisible infrastructure is that they care when it suddenly stops working um, and I think we know that 
Um, I think there was a, a few years ago for various reasons, all DOI suddenly stopped resolving. Uh, and I think people certainly cared about it on the day that it stopped working. They couldn't necessarily articulate what had broken, but they certainly knew the value of those little links that they were clicking on that said DOI at the beginning of them. Um, and I also think I have some sympathy for that invisible infrastructure and advocacy for researchers maybe being slightly lower priority because I think there's an element of us consistently going to researchers and saying you need to care about these things because it will make your life easier. And actually, I think if we put more effort into just making their lives easier rather than telling them that we're making their lives easier, uh, that would kind of be the thing that I definitely emphasize. And so again, in terms of ad advocacy, it's working with the vendors so that the new systems that come out that researchers use bake in persistent identifiers from the start so that we don't have to re-engineer new systems that come out to use identifiers. But the converse of that is when vendors are thinking about their user groups, they're thinking about researchers, we do need some friendly researchers who know about persistent identifiers, who are able to articulate what it is they need and the reasons they need persistent identifiers. So I think, yes, that advocacy more is about getting some friendly researchers on our side rather than having every single researcher in the world know about persistent identifiers. I think that would that would be the result that I'd look for. But I would also add, I, I think um, almost every, and I, and I maybe use the analogy of a train infrastructure network, that every traveler on a train knows about train infrastructure and, and sees a benefit to using it. And so the traveler doesn't know the nuts and bolts and how everything works with it. And I think that's a level that, but at a high level, there's definitely needs to be an awareness and, and a real tangible benefit for researchers in using PIDs and that awareness of the, this infrastructure and what benefits those bring. And I, I agree with your point, Rachel, that in, instead of telling them that it's beneficial, that really demonstrating that and working with those key systems and inputs that make sure that it's not just about the PID, it's about the metadata and the services and showing that those crosswalks and, and benefits in, in their day-to-day um, um, -day work. I think also there's, there's a um, maybe a comment to make here around persistent identifying infrastructure. And I speak of that from, from a data side perspective, there's, there's sometimes a, um, I guess, an eagerness to sort of assume what is beneficial for researchers um, from administrators and infrastructure providers. And it's really important that we stay um, in communication with the researchers and research groups to understand their um, different workflows. Um, you know, we, as an example, are working, we hope to start a project next year with a group um, doing consciousness research. And one of the things that we always advocate for is making data openly available, assigning a persistent identifier, but going into some of those details, we understand that brain imaging data, as an example, cannot be openly available because of certain privacy regulations. And so um, there's sometimes an assumption from a infrastructure provider that when we start having these conversations and, and try to understand how we can adapt and support those workflows, I think we then do deliver that value to to the researchers um, and agree yeah that awareness is important and knowing about infrastructure the more researchers talk about infrastructure i think um sometimes also indicates that there could be problems with that infrastructure i like matt your analogy to a train um because when you think about the sort of infrastructure for trains that used to be in the uk and there was a train to every village and then they got stopped um, and I think it's it's the same. And I, I do think it, there's a, there's an either or there's a middle road for what we're discussing. I, th I think you're quite right. There needs to be a certain level of awareness so that researchers understand um, the importance of this. So that if they go to a venue where the tracks aren't available for the train to run on, they know that that's what they're doing at that very high level and that their train is going nowhere, uh, you know? Uh, um, and so it's, it's, that, it, 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 it's that balance. Um, I also think there's uh, a huge uh, role for it. So we need the sort of basic bottom, bottom uh, uh, understanding at the research level. 
um, there also needs to be much greater awareness at uh, the top level. Um, and I'm thinking here um, in terms of whatever the PID Federation or PID Alliance ends up as, you know, there are organizations now like UNESCO where they are making recommendations about open science to the 193 member states that has very specific requirements about infrastructure, uh, open uh, uh, metadata, um, and the role of service providers as, you know, all service providers, but, you know, perhaps especially commercial uh, service providers, which have co-opted just through historical accident in a way, a lot of the uh, legacy of the infrastructure uh, and working um, with, with organizations like that to enable the advocacy within a, a sort of context sensitive uh, um, approach um, um, is, is I think an important, uh, important point of advocacy for whatever the PID Federation does that, that we, we, need to, we need to sort of get both the sort of uh, people on the ground uh, as well as the sort of uh, leaders and hopefully global leaders uh, to do this. Um, one other thing, and just in terms of benefits to researchers, I, I think a lot, a, lot of, a lot of emphasis quite rightly is put on the fact that it's gonna make their life easier. Um, um, but I also think there's a, there's, a, there's a selfish argument we can make to researchers about why infrastructure is so important to get their work known, to market their work, to get it out there. And, and we should maybe sell that one a bit more hard, uh, you know, get those sort of use cases out um, <clears throat> in different contexts. Um, and it might be different um, in uh, sort of, uh, the African continent or the Indian continent, subcontinent, compared with Europe, um, um, what those messages and use cases would specifically be. Thanks. Um, thanks for that, those um, reactions. I was hoping to uh, provoke some reactions. Let me provoke another reaction along the same lines. Um, looking at Todd's point about um, things are not truly valued if they're invisible. Um, or it's very difficult for users to value them. I mean, I, th I do agree with that. So let me put up another analogy and see what your reactions are. Um, so the, in the electricity network is um, invisible to me. I just plug something into a socket and I get electricity and I pay for it on a, a by, qu by quota. You know, the more electricity you I use, the more I pay. On the other hand, the refuse collection is also something that I value and I pay for um, through my local taxes, but I pay on a one-off, which does not depend on how much I use. So because of those different charging models, I probably am more aware when I use the electricity than I am when I put something in the refuse of the potential cost of it. So are there a, does that kind of comparison carry over to the way the business models for PIDs? Uh, just, just a comment on that. I think you are correctly on, on, on this type of analogies. Uh, and I also, in my opinion, is that probably uh, researchers do not know about all the pits or when they use pits. Uh, but at a certain level, they are more aware, should be more aware that they use uh, assistant identifiers for certain purposes. Uh, I do not think if they run workflows or do processing and in the system, PDs are provided or used to access data, uh, that they should be aware of this. But if they really have to transfer information, precisely which type of information, I think they should be more aware and that they can use PITS for, uh, for using this. So there is, a, there is a balance, I think, on this. It's not the extremes that they use, or that they need to know always that they use PEDs, or that it are completely invisible. So there, I think the balance is somewhere in the middle. Okay, I, I'd like to go back to um, a question that Todd Carpenter raised right at the beginning of this chat stream actually, which is very pertinent to the um, 
uh, the PID Federation, PID Alliance idea. Todd asked, to what extent is the PID Federation envisaged as something focused on the research ecosystem uh, and how the PID world is operating in other wider communities such as trade, finance or commerce? Um, I mean, I, I, I'd like to know what the panelists think. I mean, I suppose my perspective is that initially, at least the um, the PID Federation Alliance has got to be focused on research because this is its origin. This is um, um, how it's how it's come about from the uh, the, the the world of research. Um, I mean, longer term, I suppose the involvement of stakeholders from other areas, uh, commercial areas, would depend on to the extent to which they can identify with the the, the challenges identified for the the PID Federation. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing, for example, that that inclusion and communication are probably not seen as as, as challenges, although interoperability might be. Um, I'd like to know whether the you know, the panelists have any any thoughts on on this rather fundamental question about a PID federation. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'd like to jump in there. I, I I actually do think inclusion is possibly a challenge. Is that we don't have broad inclusion and we don't have all PIDs represented always. And so that's, that I think is a challenge. I think outside of the research ecosystem, um, maybe I won't speak to the scope of what, what the PID Commons becomes, because I think there is a sort of, because inclusion, I, I feel that inclusion is, is a particular challenge initially to get everyone um, involved. Um, I would say that the scope needs to have some sort of limitation, but I do think that there's benefit in learning from other groups. And so I use the DOI foundation as an example with BSI that is in the building industry and IDA that is in the entertainment industry, both using um, DOI technology, both uh, collaborating with other DOI RAs. And that is a good example of how we try learn and um, share ideas across infrastructure providers. And I think there's benefit to that. Um, but I, I maybe won't address the, what I think or what the scope of the, the PID Federation should be. Um, For me, this comes back to Katrina's point on use cases. I think that we much better understand the use cases we have for persistent identifiers within research and research infrastructure. And if we start to reach beyond that, actually some of the drivers, benefits and use cases then start to differ. I think there'll definitely be overlap, but I think in order for us to achieve something substantial, we have to have some kind of focus. Uh, focus within research infrastructure just so actually we're, we're focusing on the benefits drivers and use cases that are within that realm because if we open it up we'll see so many others that will distract us from I guess the core task that we have at hand at the moment. I think it's a, a really interesting question um, and in some respects uh, I, I think Initially, at least it has to focus on scholarly knowledge um, as a public good and how does the infrastructure best enable that, you know, for the benefit of science and society. Um, and that should, in a way, define the remits. But within that, within that community, there are already commercial players <clears throat> and um, there needs to be a way to enable commercial players to and I, you know, I, I'm wearing a commercial hat in this sense. I worked at PLOS, but I'm wearing a commercial hat. Enable commercial uh, players to come in and provide services without having to own the metadata or any parts of, of the infrastructure that is part of that scholarly knowledge uh, uh, where this is where I think the metadata and PIDs are part of actually that output of scholarly knowledge. Um, but we heard yesterday at the, uh, um, in Martin's talk um, uh, and others uh, uh, that there are multiple entry points that you can come in to the scholarly PID graph. <clears throat> and it seems to me that there's a huge opportunity for industry and trade to find an entry point into that scholarly graph with whatever PIDs and, uh, and, and whatever infrastructure they have. Um, and uh, I am particularly thinking of um, 
something like uh, an institution, a university who wants to be able to demonstrate the impact of what they do on their local economy within their region in terms of maybe exporting uh, research uh, uh, public private partnerships or researchers that were in academia that then go out into industry. And you could see there are ways that there might be connections which would fuel a whole different way to, to, to measure economic impact and to promote economic uh, growth within those areas by exposing bits of the uh, b- bits of the graph so it comes back to this interoperability thing that, that I think we should focus on 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 the main reason why we're doing this uh, and I think it does uh, potentially create some barriers uh, uh, for you know, for industry players if um, there is a stipulation that all the metadata has to be open for scholarly outputs or around scholarly workflows Um, But that tension is also very interesting and I just don't know how it it will play out. And I I think there's routes um, that will benefit both. And and obviously uh, whatever happens because of societies and economics involvement in research and science and just think about the sustainable development goals and COVID-19, we have to be engaged with commercial partners uh, and have some means of regulating what they do um, and ensuring that there's a very effective and competitive market so uh, we're not in the situation that we are with uh, scholarly publications at the moment. Yeah, so um, on the scope question for the Federation, I agree with the others that we do need to focus on um, benefits for research. Um, that could be private sector research as well as uh, public sector research where, um, where they have the same aims. Um, if we try and be too broad, we're just going to get lost and and not really know what to aim for. So, so that's uh, agreement there. Um, I was going to say something else. Um, oh, um, but on the other hand, where there's something going on out there that we can make use of, let's make use of it. Um, open authentication across the, a lot of commercial platforms is a really good thing, um, and maybe we can a link authentication in with that and those so in areas where the the, the commercial sector are, are, are motoring ahead let's try and take make use of that yes thank you thank you everyone for those those thoughts um i think i'd, I'd like to um since since the, we're in in an event which is entitled realizing the european open science cloud maybe this is a, a moment to ask about the relationship between sustainability of PID infrastructure um, and, and that w- would include a PID federation or alliance and the European Open Science Cloud, which is, as we know is, is motoring ahead with its own governance structures, its own studies of sustainability. Uh, of course, uh, w- one of the things we've always been aware of in, in Freya is the, is the global dimension of, of persistent identifier infrastructure. Um, so I wonder if the panelists have, have thoughts on, on how to match these up, the, the European Open Science Cloud and, and um, the global PID infrastructure and the implications for sustainability and governance? Yeah, this, this is a really difficult question, actually. Um, yeah. So let's just um, put down some baseline sort of mm-hmm. facts about the world that we're in, and then let's see if we can think about where we should go to. So EOSC is a European thing, um, without any doubt, but global interoperability is one of its major aims. Of course, global interoperability needs agreement from, you know, from both sides or every side, all the different regions. Um, the PID Alliance or Federation is, I believe, has to be global from the start. Um, and I think we've said that already. Um, but of course, Europe is one major domain where it will um, hopefully have an influence. So there is a, this is like the Venn diagram that Simon showed earlier. There are two overlapping things and there's an overlapping region in the middle. Um, but the PIDs is one aspect of EOSC which can be made global a priori, I believe. Some things are going to be more difficult. I think PIDs, because we already have um, global 
providers and the like. I think it's an area where NEOSC could say, well, we're going to make sure that we work on a global stage from the start. Um, authentication, as I just said, would be another area where I'd like to see that, but it seems to be more difficult. Um, why can PIDs be global from the start? Well, let's see what we're using them for. We're using them for uniqueness and we're using them for resolvability. Um, and both of those have to really be global um, if it's going to work. I don't have, want to have a PID that I can resolve if I happen to be sitting in Europe but won't resolve if, if I'm in the US. That just wouldn't make any sense at all, right? So that has to, and uniqueness by definition is a global thing. So that's one reason why the PID part of EOSC has to be global from the start. And then the other one is, as we talked about, the, the standardization of the metadata. Um, if we're going to enable the jumping around the PID graph as we want to sort of effortlessly and and seamlessly move around the PID graph, then we need that standardization. And again, that has to happen um, globally. We don't want to, again, it cannot depend on where I am or, or which system I'm using, whether that's possible. So, and I don't want in sort of back on the invisibility argument, I don't really care who's responsible for resolving the PID. I just want it to be resolved at a global level, again, not region dependent. So those are all arguments why I think for this part of EOSC, we have to think globally from the start. I just completely agree. I don't you know. I think it has to be because otherwise there's no point in doing this, it won't work. <laughs> I think one element for me in this is EOSC being open about saying we need to plug into a uh, global infrastructure that researches global and that to me feels relatively passive and I wonder if there's an element of the commission being able to say actually we won't just uh, make sure we don't contradict uh, what is happening in global research infrastructure that we will actively provide funds to create infrastructure that goes beyond uh, European boundaries and you know as part of that inclusion piece uh, work with other regional or national infrastructures to help them get the kind of interoperability that EOSC uh, likes to see within itself within those other regions as well if that makes sense um, so you know be actively supporting uh, other infrastructures rather than just saying well we'll kind of passively work with them really good point because uh, Europe is in a position to help um, reduce the inequity around the infrastructure from the start um, but that will actively involve underwriting some of that um, both in terms of funds but also in terms of outreach um, um, and getting stakeholders from those communities as uh, to contribute to the infrastructure as equals and experts in a way that they're not being included at the moment. No, I agree, I don't know how the commission is going to deal with that, but they, you know, in a way it's sort of, what's the term, eating their own dog food or drinking their own champagne. Um, if they want this to work um, with the principle and adhere to the principles they espouse, um, that makes a lot of sense to be much more proactive uh, about it, especially at the beginning stage. Yeah, I, I mean, I can report that it has been discussed at the EOSC Executive Board quite extensively, um, all this, this kind of area, and in the latest version of the SRIA, that's the Strategic Research and Innovation Agenda, which is the document the Executive Board will hand over to the EOSC partnership between the Association and the Commission as kind of ideas around um, the Horizon Europe program. Um, the internationalization aspect is there uh, as an action area or it's half an action area to be honest. There are 14 in all and the, the one of them is um, widening to the pri other parts of the public sector and private sector and internationalization. So it is there as an action area. Um, it happens to be the last one, the 14th out of 14. Um, I don't think that's a question of priority. It's just because it's slightly different in nature from some of the others. 
Um, so I hope it's not read as being of lower priority just because it's number 14. But it is recognized as something at the exec board and it will be in the SRIA. So hopefully um, it'll be a, a significant uh, activity in Horizon Europe. May I ask a question about that? Uh, um, so in terms of internationalization, so there's a sort of private and, and public is mm. one part and then internationalization is another part. Yeah. Um, um, does that interna internationalization include the ability of, oh, sorry, include the ability of commercial entities from elsewhere in the world to capitalize on that mm. infrastructure because that's a big part that's of big the question. equity um, question. So, I, I, you know, it seems to me that those should all be folded in. That's a good point. Um, it's not some, it's a level of detail beyond what we've considered. Um, I think we mustn't, con the fact that those two things are put in one action area is, um, is not really driven by them being seen as similar. Um, the, the widening aspect is usually, it, we're thinking of the use of EOSC for, our, it's not commercial providers, but commercial users. It's the use of EOSC for other things other than public sector research. Um, and the internationalization is the interoperability with other continents, similar infrastructures in other continents. So for the provide, for, as regards to commercial providers, that's a different issue from widening. I think that, that comes throughout all the action areas. Thanks. Right, thank you. Um, we, we are coming towards the end of the time now. I think I will just ask if there are any um, uh, further questions that anyone um, participating today would, would like to raise, either type, type into the chat um, or, or just speak. Um, see if we can you know, probably have time for one, one more short discussion, uh, if there's an appetite for that. I have one more question, but it's just it's, <laughs> Go on, <Katri. laughs> yes. it's, it's just what are the next steps? You know, if there is this entity mm. called the Alliance or the Federation, so what's the next action? How does it how does it move on from here? We've had the consult, the, the, the report from Josh that's had some recommendations. So where is it going and who's responsible for owning it? Is that the British Library now or? Where, you know, or is, do, does this discussion stop after this meeting? I, I'll answer to that first. I think as the British Library, we're definitely keen to try and move this work forwards. Uh, one of the recommendations is to do that much broader open consultation piece with the focus around uh, the three priorities identified from the slightly more closed uh, early research. Um, so what we're hoping to do is uh, find other people who are willing to work with us to look at how we can do that open consultation, find someone who's willing to give us a bit of money potentially to do that uh, in partnership with a, a, another broad group of organisations who um, not only are interested in the results and this, the, the possibilities for a pin alliance, um, but who are also working within areas where we need to do more in terms of advocacy and participation. So potentially you might partner with someone outside Europe. Yes. And it looks like there's, yes, there's some interest being expressed in the chat about, about taking this forward. Um, great. Well, I mean, I think on that, on that positive note, I think this would be a, a good moment to draw things to a close. So I'd like to thank our speakers and, and panelists very much for, um, their contributions, very stimulating and wide ranging discussion. And also thanks to everyone who raised questions and discussion points in the, in the chat. Um, so uh, fine, we're a little bit early, but I think that's fine. So thank you once again, everyone. Uh, I guess we'll stop the recording. Uh, oh, maybe 
uh, I'm sure the recording was ever started actually. Uh, no, it is, it is recording. Yes. Um, recording. Yes, yeah, great. That. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Francesca. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, great. Um, I wonder, I guess someone, I'll, I'll try and capture the, the chat because there are some interesting points uh, expressed there. Um, it's not working though. Yeah, and, uh, um, yeah, some on the chat is recorded automatically in the within the recording in a text file. Oh, brilliant. Okay, okay, that's good. Okay, so if if I uh, if if uh, we leave the session now, we won't be losing everything. No, no, no. no at great. All. Okay. Well, thanks everyone, and um, thanks, uh, uh, see you see you at some later session. I expect. Mm -hmm. Bye for now. Bye. 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 Um, while we're signing off, does anyone have access? Bye.